So Arkell started out as a combinatorial chemistry company where we have the, developed these large libraries of drugs. It then transitioned over to a kinase discovery platform where we started to look for kinase inhibitors which targeted a specific molecular subset of patients. As we are entering the era of molecular medicine, so it's more and more important to try and find the right patient for the right drug. We started a number of different programs starting out prior to me joining Arcule, maybe 12, 13 years ago. And currently we have four molecules in development, each targeting a specific population, either in cancer or in rare diseases. In the old days, we would use a shotgun approach, chemotherapy, target all kinds of uh, cells, and, and try and put the cancer into remission. In the last 20 years, we've transitioned over to try and match up the molecular characteristics of the drug, of the tumor cells, and find the key molecular driver, then target that entity with a specific drug. We have a wide experience in kinases, so all our work has really been focused to genetic aberrations that are amenable to inhibition by small molecule kinase inhibitors. The advantage of that is you're focusing on what is actually driving the tumor and you can potentially administer an agent which is much less toxic and can potentially work much better. Now we haven't got to that point yet with our drugs but that is where we strive uh, to go. I'll start with our furthest program furthest along this is a FGFR inhibitor and we've taken the approach to target FGFR2 genetic uh, aberrations, primarily FGFR2 fusions. We have a lot of development experience in hepatic malignancies and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, about 20% of patients, some studies say 10, but most around, we're finding it's closer to 20%, have an FGFR fusion. We focused our development so, as soon as we achieved a recommended phase two dose onto that type, that pop, patient population, and have moved the drug into a registrational study whereby we would potentially lead to an accelerated approvable path um, for our FGFR inhibitor in FGFR2 uh, gene amp uh, sorry, fusions um, with our FGFR inhibitor derizantinib. So basically the FGFR patient uh, tumors with the FGFR2 fusion, the signal is really turned on and drives cellular proliferation inhibiting that pathway with that type of drug will block that signaling and hopefully slow down or stop the tumor from growing. So that's the first program. You know, we, we would love to expand it because the drug could work in multiple different tumor types, but I've really tried to focus to try and get in um, as quickly as possible. The next um, sort of target that we've gone after was uh, AKT. We have a number of, a we have two AKTs in development and have had a number of years in developing these AKT inhibitors. We targeted initially for cancer, focusing on either AKT mutations or upstream mutations of AKT that are PR3 kinase mutations that run through that pathway. In the development of the drug in phase one, what we found is the first agent, mirosertib, had a relatively narrow therapeutic index in that we started to see responses in this tumor type very close to observing what we felt as on-target toxicity, that of rash, hyperglycemia, liver function changes, and uh, some GI disorders. So it was very difficult for us to move it forward as a single agent with the, with the narrow therapeutic index. We were approached by the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, headed by Dave Hyman and uh, Dr. Mackers, who presented yesterday for us, um, to try a slightly different tack. We know that there's synergy between 
the hormone receptors in hormone-driven cancers like breast, ovarian, and endometrial, and the AKT pathway. So the feeling was we could give the, an aromatase inhibitor, which is normally well tolerated, with a slightly lower dose and a slightly modified schedule of our AKT Merinsertib, hoping to get less tox with equal efficacy. And what we were able to show yesterday in the presentation is in the first look, we were able to at 150 milligrams, which is lower than our single dose where we saw efficacy in combination with the aromatase inhibitor, some nice efficacy in a molecular targeted patient population, AKT, PR3K, mutant endometrial cancer. And then obviously the next step would be to expand that trial and see what the true efficacy is in that patient population. The hope is that this study will enroll a bunch more patients and we'll be able to draw some conclusion from that. While we were doing this agent, we also developed a second generation AKT, which is more potent, better pharmaceutical properties, and a much wider therapeutic index in preclinical setting. So the hope was we could avoid some of the toxicities associated with that. We also um, presented a poster yesterday showing that the drug um, is starting to have some activity without the toxicity, but still early days and we haven't reached a dose limiting toxicity. The third approach we took with AKT was actually a very interesting approach. And this is an approach which um, was brought to us by a, um, a group at the NIH in the genetic group. So there's a, rare, a group of red overgrowth disorders which have a mosaic somatic mutation of either AKT or PR3K. So these are normal fibroblasts or with just one mutation in them. And unfortunately, as these, these kids grow, so these nests of cells produce big overgrowths, either of muscle, skin, fat, bone, CNS tissue, or AV malformations. But once again, driven by one of these mutations. What the group at the NIH was able to show that at really small uh, concentrations, much less than the concentrations we needed for cancer cells, they were able to inhibit signaling and started a phase one trial in this disease. And hopefully we've seen some nice uh, activity there as well and we'll expand that into a registration trial. So we found a way to overcome the toxicity of the AKT, use a much lower dose in a disease where that mutation is present. And you know other people are taking approaches for example in dwarfism where FGFR3 plays a role, use an FGFR3 inhibitor and I think as we better understand some of these rare disorders, some kinases will also be used to tackle diseases outside oncology using all the lessons that we uh, accumulated in the oncology drug development. The last program came about with a very strong collaboration with Ohio State University with uh, Dr. John Bird and his group under Jennifer Wojcik, where they um, discovered that one of the mechanisms of resistance to uh, BTK inhibitors was the development of a C4, C481S mutation. So we looked, went through our library and came up with an inhibitor that targeted the C481S mutation. The inhibitor that's currently in the clinic also hits the wild type, so it gives you an opportunity to hit both subsets of cells. Um, and that study has started enrollment in phase one. We've got quite a lot of preclinical data presented in this meeting showing the utility of that agent. But hopefully that agent will be able to move if once we get a recommended phase two dose, test the efficacy in that subset with the mutation, and then take it to the next step.